for me, it starts in a parking lot at a dead show in March of 93 at Rosemont Horizon. And then I had just a direct path from there to Wetlands, which led me to Jammies and Relics and Brooklyn Bowl and then the Capitol and then Lock It and then Fairly Well and then here, and then here kind of. You know, I, if I hadn't gone, I, I actually don't believe I'd be doing this talk with you. You know, I just wasn't planning to go make a film on the Grateful Dead. I love trying to make magic happen. And uh, I've been doing that for a while. I'm going to keep trying to do it every once in a while. It happens more times than not. It does not, you know. But when it does, then you want to make more. And uh, so I'm still chasing that. I think of you know, Grateful Dead, Fish, Miles, Mahavishnu, all these people that have inspired me over the years and the approach that they've taken, I think that's informed the approach that I take to what I do. First and foremost, a jam's not gonna work if everybody's not, again, egoless but confident. I said that earlier, but that's really true of what I do. You have to be egoless. You have to be part of the collective. That doesn't mean you deny the fact that you have a certain skill set or you have a certain talent, but you have to sort of let that go. You have to sort of free yourself of certain things to be part of, uh, to, to achieve a larger goal. So here we are with Peter Shapiro and Dean Budnick. So for everyone out there listening, Peter Shapiro, in case you do not know, he's one of the most notable independent concert promoters, uh, really, of all time. He owned the legendary Wetlands in Tribeca, now runs a Brooklyn Bowl, NYC, Las Vegas, Philly, Nashville, the Capitol Theater, you know, helping put on lock-in, was the promoter of Fairly Well, Grateful Dead 50 tour with members of the Dead and Trey. And Peter's just come out with an autobiography titled The Music Never Stops co-authored by Dean Budnick here, who we also have on the show today. Dean here is the editor-in-chief of Relics, host of the Fish podcast, Long May They Run, and he's also a widely acclaimed author and documentarian. Peter and Dean, so glad to have you both here today. How's it going, guys? Well, we're good to be here together. Uh, you know, we did this whole thing together, and we've done a lot together, so it's fun to uh, talk to you as a team. Hell yeah. So... To start this off, I'd love to hear you two talk about what you feel have been some of the key attributes, traits, characteristics of you guys that have allowed you to excel in this line of work. Oof. Well, you just, you know, you just got to be a fighter, you know, and a scratcher and be willing to put your hand in the toilet sometimes and try to grab the, the, the crap out that's like going away and shooting down from you and bring it back because to put on shows and to be an entrepreneur or to run a magazine, any of this stuff, it's hard, you know, and uh, a lot of stuff flying around and you just got to be ready to get dirty and do whatever it takes to make things happen and never stop. Like it never really pauses, you know, and, and running venues that are open seven nights a week. It, you know, you, when you get up the next day, there's another show, you know, and you got to be ready to keep going. And um, so that's what I've gotten, you know, doing this now 26, 27 years, I guess, pretty, hopefully pretty good at. And, uh, I know the way Dean works. And that's where we get along where it is kind of a similar, that's, a, you know, similar mentality. I mean, listen, we, Peter and I certainly share a work ethic and we know that we can pretty much find each other any time of day if, if needed, morning, afternoon, evening, late night, et cetera. Obviously what I do is a little bit different than what Peter does. So if you're asking me as a writer, you know, as an editor, what I think is important to, to what I do. I mean, what I really aspire to do is to be kind of confident but egoless you know you can't you have to have faith that you're you know that you're tacking in the right direction but don't get too caught up in the fact that you're out there on on the water doing this thing I know that's how Peter approaches everything that he does as well and I try to you know conduct myself in as righteous a way as I can as Peter 
certainly does, and then sort of bring everything together. As a, as a writer, one last point on this, I would just say, I think it's really important to be a reader and don't just read, I, I'm predominantly a music journalist, but I'm always working, you know, two books, a book of fiction and a book of nonfiction. And I, you know, I'm reading, Peter might be me. I'm generally reading three newspapers a day. Peter reads, reads a, a ton. Uh, and I think that's really important to just have all these things coming at you that you can then synthesize in, in some way and then chuck out again into the world. Mm. Yeah, it's good. To, it's important to know what's going on in, in all different parts, in, in music, obviously, but also for me, just the world, you know, it's helpful when planning things and being aware of what's going on different times of the year, in different parts of the country, what's happening all over that, that impacts, you know, there's a lot of parts to the puzzle and information and being aware and just like, and, and you can get granular in terms of how bands are doing in each market or what bands doing what and who's touring and who they're playing with on tour to just the vibe in a certain state politically and, and what you want to do there. It's like, it's all part of the puzzle. Mm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know, if, I don't, can't remember, Cam, if you mentioned at the outset, but Peter also is the, right, is the chair of Headcount. And within that context, you would expect that he would know a lot about politics, which he does. But I mean, pretty much day to day, one of the reasons that I enjoy talking to him, can we pretty much talk, I would say at least once a day, if not, you know, sometimes a lot more, is that he's so aware of what's going on culturally, politically, socially, in, in the country, be part of it because he just, you know, he wants to be, because that's important to him, but also for, 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 his, for his job. And between those two things, I mean, he always has something going on. He's a great sounding board for many, many topics above and beyond the music industry. I want to dive deeper down this, like looking back at key inflection points over, over the years. What do you think are some of the most important things as a team you guys have gotten right that have allowed you to have this sustained success that you've had? Uh, I'll start. Well, we started our, our collaboration on the Jammy Awards. Uh, we started, which the first one was in the year 2000, uh, in June of 2000, I believe, at Irving Plaza. It's in the book, I think. And uh, Dean and I co-produced that. Wow, that's 22 years ago plus um and then we did like we've done we did eight of them or seven or eight um and the each one of those was like 20 different artists collaborating and jamming together and putting on a whole show and doing sponsors and filming it and selling tickets and marketing the show and like when you do that with someone and it's an award show and then there are the awards and voting on the awards and who's giving out the awards and uh, that's and then presenting the awards and actually making awards like that's a big thing you know that that was like six months of the year you know uh maybe more because once the event happens you start planning the net right dean we were planning the next one pretty soon after um so we that was our first collaboration and we've also and I'll let Dean maybe take into the, the movie. But um, so Dean and I, that's why I chose, I wanted to do the book. I mean, it's more the story of 50 shows than my biography. You know, it's really through obviously 50 shows comes through my perspectives and it shows at my venues and some other ones. But I chose to really do it because Dean had been a wingman around a lot of those shows. You know, I think if we go back and look at the 50, Dean, you were probably at about half of them. But uh, we did a lot, you know, to get to do this. Dean really wrote, we did what we're doing now. You know, we talked a lot, hundreds of phone calls, each one for a couple of hours. The, the, the appearance of COVID helped us get through this in a way, the book, because there were more nights when we were both home than I'm home, you know, than normal, you know, and we would get on the phone and talk through and I'm, uh, 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 our memories and thank God we can remember a bunch. You know, if I had, if we had waited, I, I don't really get how people, when they wait till they're 75 to do this, how do you remember what's going on? Because <laughs> I can barely remember it now. 
but uh, I'm really glad we did it. But Dean and our collaborations in the past, that's a big reason why I um, wanted to do this. Mm. Well, if you made it this far, thank you for listening. Just want to let y'all know we've got these hand-dyed, ice-dyed, weird music podcast tees. And we're also going to be making some sweatshirts. So if you'd like one, let us know. We'd love to get you one. Also want to give a big shout out to the geniuses over at Thrax CBD for sponsoring this show with their amazing products. Got a link in the description. Also, big thank you to our sponsor, J&J Distribution, Ohio's premier CBD and Delta 8 wholesale supplier. Retailers, check out their brands, Kush Burst, 3Chi, THC Edibles, and CBD MD. And also want to give a big thank you to our local print shop, Franklinton Press. If you need any custom merch or custom printing, hit them up. They'll take good care of you. We got links in the description. And yeah, much love, y'all. Now back to the show. Dean, I want to ask you, with working with Peter over the years, I'd love to hear you talk about some of the things you've come to admire most about him. And then, Peter, likewise with Dean, I'd love to hear you answer that next. Well, listen, I just think he's got, I have a lot of faith in his perspective in his taste in his approach in the way he conducts himself he does things for the right reasons <clears throat> if he's putting on a mu- any kind of event he looks at through the lens of a fan because as i'm sure he'll tell you he is a fan the reason he puts on these shows because he wants to go to shows that that's the thing like the reason i write a book is i want to read a book i wanted to read a book about the ticketing industry so i wrote a book on ticketing um, I wanted to read a book that John Popper, right, told his story from the, as he came up. And so, all right, hey, John, let's write a book together so we can do that. Same thing with Peter. Like, I've heard him so many times in so many contexts riff about a lot of the ideas that are in here that at one point I just said to him, you know, you should write, you should write a book. You, you should do, you should share these, this with the world while you can. And I think one of the things that I really like about this book is every chapter is a balance. You get a little bit of insight into how Peter does what he does. Um, You get a sense of how the scene has evolved and developed as it did. And you'd also get a sense of like sort of the kind of the the humor and absurdity, the context in which all of this takes place. And sometimes it's deadly serious as well. Don't misunderstand me. But, um, you know, all of that comes together inside of the book. And all of that is why I enjoy working with Peter and we're still going after it two decades plus in we got to figure out what we're going to do next dude <laughs> I know. fair peter over to you so dean's a harvard phd he also wrote the book on jam bands 1.0 you know and 2.0 like and, and we tried to make this book less i think it's my story a bit but it's also about the broader scene you know which is cool to see it's still thriving you know, and newer bands now with Goose and Billy Strings and Twiddles and Pigeons and Spaffords and, and just what's happening. Um, it still goes, you know, and I've gotten to be a part of it, thank God. And it's in the book, you know, from being on it, originally going on Dead Tour and making a film about it almost 30 years ago, summer 93. And it really is the trip from then. You know, for me, it starts in a parking lot at a dead show in March of 93 at Rosemont Horizon, you know, right outside Chicago. And then I had just a direct path from there to Wetlands, which led me to doing stuff with Dean the Jammies and Relics and Brooklyn Bowl and then the Capitol and then Lock It and then Fairly Well and then here, you know, and here kind of, you know. I, if I hadn't gone, I was a student at Northwestern, a film student, if I hadn't, my friend been like, let's go see the dead at Rosemont Horizon. It was only the second dead show I had ever seen. I saw my first one the summer before at Giant Stadium. I, I actually don't believe I'd be doing this talk with you. You know, I just wasn't planning to go make a film on the Grateful Dead. And that film led me to Wetlands, you know, which became the whole thing for me. You know, the owner of Wetlands saw the film, Larry Block made this documentary it's actually online on youtube it's called and miles to go it's on the relics channel and i went after this experience i had at rosemont horizon and ending up in a parking lot and snowing and i see all these kids who are also 20 
but they're not going back to Northwestern, you know, or home, you know, the drum circles and the school bus were going strong. And I was just like, wow, you know, I'd never seen anything like that. So I actually went to the library the next morning, I stayed up through the night, I swear. And I was at doors. You talk about being at doors for a show so you can run and get, you know, right on the rail. Well, I was at doors uh, for the library that next day by 9 a.m. Uh, to see what had been done about that scene around the debt. You know, kind of mm. like Dean, you wanted to do something on ticketing. So you wrote the, you know, I was just like, wow, I'd never seen anything like this deadhead scene outside the show. And uh, so I, and then uh, just a couple months later, I went on the road. I found another film kid who had a video camera. We rented a van, a Ford, you know, a Conaline 350, all white, no windows, which I learned firsthand is not the best way to go make it shoot a documentary on Dead Tour because we showed up at the first show at Auburn Hills in this white van with no windows with camera, you know, with a big camera and, and everyone was like, DEA, DEA. <laughs> exactly. Good call. <laughs> so we we're like, oh shit, you know, keep driving. Let's get away from here. We'll come. So we drove a couple blocks away and then walked back with the camera. But you know, you learn some things, you know, when you do it, you know, and that's that's happened for me a lot through this path, this last 25 years. Like you don't know um for sure until you actually really do it. You don't know how this venue will work or taking over relics or these colors. It could be about the colors of the walls, you know, the venue or the sound system or anything. But a lot of people will tell you a oh, Brooklyn Bowl concept the bowl won't work. You know, you can't. And but you don't really know till you do it. We learn like maybe we can't do solo acoustic music, can't do a Tori Amos on piano show. But it works really well for Ivan Neville and Dumpster Funk, you know, and uh, so you just learn by trial, you know, you just got to be able to try stuff and then adjust and then try it again and keep going and just do that long enough. You got to just survive long enough doing that until you kind of get it. And then it, mm -hmm. then it gets a little, never gets easy, but it gets easier, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's supposed to. <laughs> Can I just chime in on this? I just, I just want to, uh, I want to, in terms of Peter, right? The thing about, the thing about him is he's, he's really collaborative. I, I think a lot of people will pay lip service to that and they say they're collaborative, but he legitimately is. He's open to any idea from who, who met, from whomever might have an idea. He'll, he'll poll everybody. At the end of the day, he makes the decision. It's in the book, right? He's a benevolent dictator. But and which I think makes sense for what he does, but he asks everybody's opinion. And when someone has something to contribute, he builds on that and he uses it. Uh, the other thing, and again, I hear everybody say this work hard, play hard. Dude, it definitely works hard, plays hard. I've seen him in action on both sides of that. And it's great. And the other thing, and I think this is something that he's taught me because I've seen this happen time and again over the years is when things go to shit, and sometimes they go to shit, just how to hold it together and respond. And there's, I was just thinking as Peter was talking, there's one moment in the book where we had worked on this. There's a, a film about wetlands, a documentary that I directed, he produced, and we had our world premiere screening at the Ziegfeld, the Ziegfeld Theater in New York with a thousand people there. And we we had to adjust the, um, the output of the film so that it could be projected digitally onto this gigantic screen and light, we both made our introductions, lights went down and the film sync was off. Like it was horrific. You could not watch the film. In that moment, I stand up, I'm running to the projection room. I look over, there's one other dude who's doing just, just the same thing, it's Peter. So we both, we run up, we charge to the projection room we're, we're spitballing, we're pacing around, we're figuring out what to do. And three or four minutes later, we, we came up with the plan of action. We shut it down, re, we reset it. And it came, it came across beautifully. And, and then we pulled that off. And by the way, another part of the story is that at the same time, while all this was going on, Peter's wife was exceptionally pregnant. And in fact, a few hours later gave birth to their, you know, to their, to their daughter. 
and all of this is going through his head and he's holding it together and solving the problem. And that's why it's sort of, I think it's fun and inspiring to, to work with him in a variety of contexts. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to jump back to Thanks, that. Thanks, bud. That's true, man. All true. I want to jump back to that, but for now, I want to, I want to jump to the side. I'm, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on this. So on this podcast, we talk a lot about how the principles of improvisational music, they also apply to other areas of life. Like, for example, uh, we'll talk about consistencies between improvisational music and mindfulness. And a lot of times that comes back to the importance of deep listening, um, both to, to like the rest of the band, but also listening to one's own intuition and you know, then the way that kind of thing applies to other areas of life. And I'd love to hear from you two, like, how do you feel that principles of improvisational music might apply to areas of your two lives? Um, well, I could say my whole professional life, business career, you know, trying to make all these things happen. It is like being on a jam. And I may have even said that earlier when we started before you even brought the question up, I think. That it is, you know, there's peaks and valleys. And like, and it goes slower and it goes faster. Like, you got to be prepared to like, for the slowdown, you know, and the down part, the downbeat. And just stay in the zone and stay focused, you know, when there's a lot flying around to be able to join your fellow musicians and finding the groove to the next peak and we all know that's why we love this music as long as you watch fish or any of the bands the dead obviously and jerry by the way doesn't always work you know you've been there like a jam like not every fit you know it doesn't always get there uh, which is why when it does get there it's really special and it's awesome and you all feel it fish is really incredible if you ever watch a show from pretty far away up high but kind of close to the stage you can see, I've seen this before, this may sound crazy mystical, but like this circle loop, the loop between the fans, you know, and Trey when he comes out and walks out to the lip of the stage a little and he's leaning out into that and like they're leaning into him and you can just see him giving it out to them, the energy and sometimes he'll point his guitar out you know, and so you can see almost the energy coming off the guitar and him and he's like leaning in and grooving and smiling and his hair, you know, bobbing and he kicks it out to the crowd. I believe this, you know, so, and then the crowd kicks it back like to him. He's feeling it come at him. The crowd's feeling it come at them. And so it's a circle. You know, and maybe it's maybe it's deeper in second set when I've seen it. And you're like you're standing it a bit away, but you can almost see the circle of how he feeds off of them, and then um, they feed off him, and then they feed him. You know, it goes right. And so the jam for me, you know, I just got to stay on my feet and stay in the jam. It's a long jam I've been on. You know, he'll go. <laughs> And just keep it going. There's times when you think it's going to break, you know, and pause. And you get setbacks. And that's one of the things that's in the book. You know, you have setbacks, you get no's. But, you know, a lot of no's can lead to eventual future yeses. You know? Um, and that's when you're in the slower part of the song. You get the no, you're grooved, you're down. I mean, you just got to maneuver and figure out how to get back to the peak. Hmm. I do want to that's point out, by the way, Keith. yeah, listen, Trey agrees with what you said, right? One of my interviews with him for, for Relics, he was talking about how he had an experience on the stage where he felt like as, as a jam unfolded that everyone in the room was contributing to it. Even some people who were off in the bathroom. I mean, that's part of the whole thing, the, the, the collective. And Tim, to get, to get back to your question in terms of you know, how improvisation has inspired me. I think of, you know, Grateful Dead, Fish, Miles, Mahavishnu, all these people that have inspired me over the years and the approach that they've taken. I think that's informed the approach that I take to what I do. First and foremost, a jam's not going to work if everybody's not, again, egoless but confident. I said that earlier, but that's really true of what I do. You have to be egoless. You have to be part 
of the collective. That doesn't mean you deny the fact that you have a certain skill set or you have a certain talent, but you have to sort of let that go. You have to sort of free yourself of certain things to be part of uh, to to achieve a larger goal, you also have to be open minded. I think you have to listen, uh, and I think all these things seem real simple, but I, I guarantee you, all three of us uh, can can think of how how rare I think it truly is in which people all together collectively execute, where a team of people do just that, and when you do, it's something pretty glorious I think that it, that ensues and that's something that I always aspire to I can't say I always hit it but I'm always in that in that range hoping to achieve that goal I love that I love that totally what do you think it is about music that can cause it for it to heal people well our friend uh Mickey Hart would just talk about the physio you know the physiological properties of music, and, and frankly, I think part of that is 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 true. By the way, and in in the book, you know, Peter talks about how he can only go so much time without seeing another show, and I think part of that is just sort of the nature of, of rhythm and vibration, and sort of the the tribal nature of of why we connect with music. And I think some of it is 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 in your head as well and where it takes you and how it inspires you. I mean, that's what brings me back night after night or whenever I go, that's what I'm looking for. People that who are gonna take me somewhere new, somewhere different. And I think that that experience is part of sort of a holistic healing uh, experience, you know, in its, own, in its own right. Yeah, you can't get sitting home watching Netflix you know, or what you get at that peak moment we were talking about at a show. And for me, at least the live part keeps me going in that jam. Otherwise, I'd stop and walk off. You know, the daytime part, the coordinating, the HR of it all, the dealing with problems during the day, the more like that part gets old, you know, it's not as healing. But, but I need my healing from that is the show the shows you know you still that part never fades for me you know i don't think for anyone you know and hopefully during covid you know people m realized you know how much they miss they love the live thing i mean i i know the core base of live people they saw a lot of shows pre-covid they'll see a lot post but i'm hoping that over time maybe the base of people that are active, really active showgoers, alpha showgoers grows because they got a couple of years spending more time at home, which is nice. And you can watch a lot of TV, but then they're like, you know what? This Saturday night, you know, so I'm going to choose to go to a show rather than just binge watch, you know, the new stranger things, you know, which is easy. And that didn't exist by the way. Like, when I had wetlands, there were no streaming, no podcasts, none of that. But now, even when Brooklyn Bowl opens in 2009, 13 years ago, there was no streaming platforms. Um, so that's a different environment because it's a little hard. There's, it's much easier. There were no podcasts. What we're doing now didn't really exist in 09 you know there were still movies and books and but there were no tiktok you know so and so you had facebook twitter was new uh no snap no tiktok i don't think even instagram in 09 so at least some of those platforms make it easier right to share info about an upcoming show to promote in some ways it's easier than ever but i'll give you an interesting thing i don't i think dean we put this in a book i'm not even sure in when, when Wetlands was around the 90s, the Village Voice was really big. And every city had their version of the Village Voice. But, so you could go to Chicago or Denver or, Denver or San Fran and open up SF Weekly or the Village Voice, go to the music section, see the show listings, the ads. So you could go through those ads and see like who's playing in Irving Plaza, Roseland, The Garden, Wetlands, CBGBs, Tramps, and, and, and in 15 minutes have a great feel for what shows were coming to New York, to Tri-State area. Mm -hmm. You ready for this? And this is the 90s. 
in a way that was more effective. You can't do that. Now you might be on the Brooklyn Bowl email. You might be on the Irving email list or a live nation. You know, you have a sense of this, that, but you actually don't have as good of a feel for all the shows that are coming to town in the next few weeks as you could 25 years ago opening the print paper that's now gone. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting to show now. Now, can we turn on a dime at Brooklyn Bowl or the Capitol or something and announce a show that's going to happen? Like if we were on this call now, we we're like, let's go do this idea of a show and do it tomorrow, Monday, right? It's Friday night or sat Saturday or Sunday. We could do it because of the giant email list and our own socials. We're back in the day at Wetlands. We could, we'd have to like call the radio station you know, to announce it, make flyers, right? We didn't have the ability to just press a button and let tens of thousands of people know immediately. So it's just interesting how technology, some things get easier, like announcing a show tomorrow, we can let a lot of people know. But in terms of knowing all the shows coming through New York, it was in a weird way easier to do that in 1998 than it is today with that Village Voice spread. My next question, we talk a lot on this podcast about like, you know, with people who've had success uh, and like, you know, a great career, how all that glitters is not is not necessarily gold. I'm curious with with all the success both of you ha have had in your career, like what has that taught you about what actually brings you true fulfillment? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, well, you know, for me family it is true you know when you're hanging with them like that's a great feeling that that great peak moment at a show for me it's like those peak moments at a show and family i guess it's a little trite you know but uh it's true you know they, 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 that coming together it takes a lot of work both <laughs> with looking back on your life while working on this autobiography i'm interested like was this process of writing this book a reminder for you looking back on your life about how how time flies and how precious our life is like how precious our time is if you don't mind me asking do you do either of you feel anxious about like the end of life like i'd love to hear how you two resonate with that idea i'm not sure sure about end of life listen i feel good i got this down I did part of the reason to choose to lean into writing this stuff down. You know, the Dean was there was a big part, the biggest, you know, we had a cool publisher with a shed and we figured out a cool way to do it with telling it through 50 shows. But part of it was like, if anything weird ever happened and weird shit happens, you know, you get hit by a car walking across the street on a green light. You know, if I get knocked over by a truck one day, I will feel a little bit better on my way to heaven, hopefully knowing that the book, uh, at least this first 50 years, you know, is written down, you know, so, and I would recommend any, you know, but I, I really don't know how I would remember that I wouldn't if I had waited much longer. I don't think so. And, and it helped out being the internet helps too, you know, if anyone, you know, be able to go back and look at who was where, what the date was, what the set list was, at least for this book, you know, who was playing. Right, Dean, we were able to go back a bunch and confirm, like, who played here? and Who did this? And so I don't think about end of life, but I feel a lot better, at least now, that if I was to go, that this thing's done. I think that to the extent that I ever felt, you know, anxiety about what, about what you described, Cam, I think that improvisational music and the idea of being in the moment all the time. I think that has given me some comfort in terms of just, you know, thinking about being here, being now, and that's what's, that's what's important and mm -hmm. trying to embrace that. And that does, you know, when you're, when you're at that, the, that peak uh, of the show, when you're in that peak jam and that's all where you, that's where you need to be at that time. You know, I try to carry that out into the world with me when I can. And, and I do think that informs just how I approach, how I approach life. I love that. I love that answer. So, you know, in looking at you two individually, you know, so Peter, we'll start with you, what you're all about, what you've been through, your life journey, a mantra to sum up 
you know, who you are and what you're all about? What would you say that is? Um, I love trying to make magic happen. You know, that's fun for me, you know, and uh, that's a pretty good mantra, right? I try to make magic happen. And uh, I've been doing that for a while. I'm going to keep trying to do it every once in a while. It happens more times than not. It does not, you know, but when it does, then you want to make more. And uh, so I'm still chasing that. Hmm. Man, for me, I, I just try to be egoless, righteous, and true. I don't always hit it, but those are the goals. And those are goals that come right out of the music I love, the artists who've inspired me, the promoters who I've seen in action over the years, like Mr. Shapiro. That's how I, that's how I go after it. And when I hit it, it's a beautiful thing. And when I don't quite achieve it, there's, there's always the next moment. There's always tomorrow. Hell yeah. Dean and Peter, round of applause. Much love. Thank you guys so much for all that you do. Huge fan. Really admire everything. Awesome. Hey, I got hey, one final hey, question. Brother. Yeah, bring it. I'd love for you two to talk to me about what you think are some of the key things that distinguish good leaders from incredible leaders or rather that distinguish incredible leaders from good leaders. That's a tough one. Um, you know, listen, this same kind of spirit of the jam and, and, and um, length, you know, making it in the um, double overtime, you know, in, in sports or double on course, triple on court, you know, keeping the team fight, you know, going forward in the car on the road for an extended period of time. You know, it's easier to do it for a little while, you know, and a good leader, you need good leader to even do it for a little while. But, you know, we we actually figured out through doing the book that I put on 10,000 shows or more. Now, I wasn't at every one of those, but but if something went wrong at any of those shows, I was the one getting the phone call, which, you know, that's and so like it to endurance, you know, and and by the way, we talk about you've been we've all been to great shows that like go and go. And it's like still raging. And it's not just jam band. Springsteen does those four hour shows. Um, so for me, I would say the endurance the keeping that jam going and keeping the team with you makes the difference between a good and great leader. And, and just because it gets tired, everything after a while, you get tired, you know, but you got to keep pushing on. And mm. uh, that, would, that would be my answer. Dean, curious what you're going to say. Well, I mean, you, know, you know what, but, you know, Peter just made this point how things go wrong and people call, people call him. From all, and what I would say is there are plenty of, of people in positions of power like him, and he's in a position of power in which people would be afraid to call him. But everyone knows that Peter will respond in the right way, that he, he's very approachable and he's not so distanced from what's going on. So I, I think empathy and understanding the context of a situation is really, really important and not distancing yourself from the other people who work with you. And establishing some sense of a, of a collaborative venture. I personally think that's why Peter, had, that's part of his, you know, the reasons for his success from my perspective is just watching how everyone is very keen on working with him because he creates an environment where it feels like everyone is participating. And the reason why it feels like that is because everyone is participating. And so every can, everyone can really dig in on these collective goals and celebrate them collectively. It's that, you know, Peter just isn't taking the victory lap. He makes sure everyone is with him when that's happening, if there's a victory lap, because a lot of times there's another show the next day and people have to dig in for, for the next one. But I think one of the things that I've taken away, again, just from watching Peter in action is just the way he's able to bring everyone along with him. And I think that's really important. Mm, I love that. I love it. Guys, thank you so much. Peter Shapiro, Dean Budnick. If you listen this far, check out that book. Thank you guys so much. I, this is a good jam. I feel like we made the magic happen. Very collaborative. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Thanks.